to my channel. I'm Steph. So you've probably seen around booktube different creators making videos that surround the Goodreads Choice Awards. Whether or not it's them reading an entire category or them reading all of the Choice Award winners. But back in October when the Goodreads Choice Award nominees were announced, there was a discussion that happened on Twitter talking about the lack of diversity and by POC author nominations. And if you were paying attention to the conversation and the nominations, you will have noticed that it was very wide. I think the other aspect of it was that really popular authors were continuously getting put into categories where historically speaking they have always won every single year that they are put in that category. So for example Stephen King tends to always win the horror category and Sarah J Maas wins whatever category she's in whether it's YA fantasy or fantasy in general. And Princess tweeted out asking if any black or POC booktubers wanted to start their own Goodreads Choice Awards that focused on by POC authors. So Princess partnered with Jasmine and Ashley and they all created the Shaded Choice Awards. I mean there's an entire website. They went all out for this and it was incredible to see it come together. The winners were announced on December 8th and I was surprised to find out that of the 12 I had read seven of them and so there were five remaining books that I decided I wanted to read. So that's what we will be doing in this vlog. I will be reading the remaining five Shaded Choice Award winners. But first, I wanted to take you through the seven that I did read, give you my rating on them. And then I want to predict the star ratings of the remaining five that I'll be reading for this video, just because I think it'll be fun to see if I know my tastes at all, which spoiler alert, I probably don't. So of the winners that won that I have read, I read Hood Feminism, which won for the nonfiction category, and I gave this a five stars. I've read The Only Good Indians, which won for the mystery and thriller. I also gave this a five stars. I read Mexican Gothic, which won for the horror category. I gave this one four stars. I read Black Sun, which won for the fantasy category, and I gave this a resounding five stars. I read The Space Between Worlds, which won for the science fiction category, and I gave this a four stars. I read Cemetery Boys, which won for the YA fiction category, and I gave this one four stars. And the last one I read was Ray Bearer, which won for the YA fantasy category, and I gave this a four stars. So as for what I will be reading in this vlog, I will be reading the middle grade winner, which was Ghost Squad. And I've actually seen this around and have been kind of interested in it, but I don't read a lot of middle grade. So my prediction is that I will give this a four out of five stars. So Ghost Squad is about our main character to Lucelli and her best friend Sid, they accidentally cast a spell that wakes up malicious spirits that start wreaking havoc all over St. Augustine. So together they must join forces with Sid's witch grandmother Babette and try to stop these malicious spirits. I'll be listening to this one on audiobook because I did find it on Scribd and honestly the cover is so cute. I love this cover. Also, I love ghosts. I love a good ghosty story. Casper is like one of my favorites. So I do have high hopes for this. The next book I'll be reading is The Band Book Club, which won for the graphic novel category. And this is actually a graphic novel memoir. And this was very hard to find. Because I don't love writing memoirs, this will be hard for me. But I do think it'll be a five out of five stars, basically because of the premise. So this is in 1983 South Korea. During South Korea's Fifth Republic, there's a military regime that has entrenched its power through torture, censorship, and even murdering protesters. And we have our main character, who's actually the author of this book, Kim Hyun Suk, and she's a freshman in college, and she gets herself involved with this guy who runs a band book club, and she starts to learn about protests that are happening behind the scenes and about banned literature and this group of kids who are kind of fighting against this military regime. So I'm really excited about this one because A, I haven't heard anything about it. B, I don't really know anything about this time period in South Korea's history and I want to learn more. And C, because I, I do enjoy memoirs a lot. So I'm looking forward to reading it in a graphic novel format. I don't believe I've ever done that. I don't believe I've ever read a graphic novel memoir. The next book I'll be reading is Take a Hint Danny Brown, which won for the romance category. And in 2020, I think it was like mid 2020, I read Get a Life Chloe Brown and I really loved it. As someone who's not a romance reader, I really, really enjoyed that one. So I do feel like I will give this a four out of five stars. 
mainly because Talia Hibbert has some of the best banter and dialogue. So I think that alone will make me love this book. So this one follows Chloe's sister, Danica Brown, and she's an academic. She works at a university and she's friends with a security guard named Zaf. And Zaf has an interesting past. He used to be a rugby player and now he runs a nonprofit talking about mental health and masculinity in sports. And one day Danica finds herself in a situation where Zaf rescues her, it's caught on camera, and they end up in a fake dating relationship type situation because it ends up helping his nonprofit get some recognition. I can't say whether or not I like the fake dating trope. I haven't read it in a book before, but I have enjoyed it in like movies and television. So I am looking forward to this. I do think that fake dating usually has an element of pining to it, which was the thing that I loved in Get a Life Chloe Brown. And I've learned I'm a sucker for pining. <laughs> So I really hope that's in this book. The next book I will be reading is Legendborn, which won for the debut novel category. And I predict that I will give this a five out of five stars. I really do think I'll give it a five out of five stars. I'm just a little bit nervous because this is supposed to be a King Arthur retelling. And I didn't know that when I a bought the book and B when I saw that it was a winner. But then I officially read the synopsis and realized that it's a King Arthur retelling. But I think it could go deeper than that. And I think I could really enjoy this. And this book follows our main character, Brie, who has just lost her mother and has just enrolled into the UNC Chapel Hill program for high schoolers. So she ends up at a college party where she sees a magical attack and they try to erase her memory, but they find out that it doesn't work. She gets ensnared into the secret society where she enlists one of the more powerful people in the secret society to help her figure out if they were a part of her mother's death. She's become suspicious that maybe there was more to her mother's death than meets the eye. And this story is supposed to follow the secret society, but also her learning about the secret society and whether or not they were involved with her mother's death. I think the thing that intrigues me the most is the fact that there's a secret society and they could have like some sinister vibes. Um, but the King Arthur thing, ugh, no shade King Arthur, but I just don't care about you and yours. And the last book I'll be reading for this vlog is The Vanishing Half, which won for the fiction category. And this was one of my most anticipated books of 2020, but my reading last year was weird and I didn't pick it up and I regret it, but now, as great as time as any. What did I just say? I don't know. I think I'll give this a five out of five stars though. And this is basically following two identical twin sisters who grew up in a Southern black community, but the community is odd. And the fact that everybody in this community has light skin and they try to have babies in a way where everybody has light skin. So one day the twins decide that they're going to leave this community and upon leaving they actually go their separate ways and one of the twins actually goes into society passing as a white woman and the other twin takes a very different trajectory and I think that this story follows multiple people in this family so it's a generational story and I've come to learn that I really like generational stories so I'm really looking forward to this. It's been getting nothing but rave reviews. So I'm ready to be broken. So those are the five books that I'll be reading. And I think I'm going to start with The Vanishing Half. And I will keep you guys updated on my thoughts and feelings about all these books throughout this vlog, because that's the point of vlogging. Okay, bye. Good morning. Happy Friday. It's Friday, a week after I actually started reading The Vanishing Half and did the first clips of this vlog. I'm gonna be real, I've been struggling with my anxiety and depression. So YouTube did this really fun thing where they suggested me reaction videos from Whitney Port. And if you don't know, Whitney Port is from The Hills and then she got a spinoff show called The City. And recently she's been doing reaction videos to The City and then they just started The Hills. So I think they're only two seasons into it. Yeah, so I didn't read at all. I didn't read. I don't know what reading is, apparently. I've just been laying on the couch watching these videos and then I got all caught up on all of them and decided to just continue on with The Hills because it's on Hulu. It's a wild ride. I have lots of thoughts. Luckily, one of my new friends on Twitter decided that she was gonna start watching it and we've been just starting to message about it. It's been hilarious. I love her commentary on the show. So that's the truth. I just, I haven't been reading. I've been laying around, taking naps, watching a show, sometimes playing video games, 
eating snacks. That's been my life. That being said, I did actually read 80 pages of The Vanishing Half before I stopped reading and I was loving it. I actually was quickly absorbed into the story and really enjoying the characters. So my plan is, is to get myself motivated by finally setting up my reading journal. It's like the 2nd of January right now, and I'm going to set up my reading journal and listen to The Vanishing Half. And since I basically draw everything, it takes me a few hours. And I just got the audiobook on Libro FM. I found my place in the audiobook and because of the speed that I listened to it on, it says that I should be done in like four hours. So even if I finish in less than four hours, which sounds ridiculous, that sounds ridiculous, but you know, time flies when you're drawing shit. But no, seriously, if I don't finish it while doing the journaling, I'll probably just play Animal Crossing or Mario Kart because I've really been into Mario Kart recently. Good morning. It is a day. I don't actually remember what day it is. That's like what life has come to is that I don't remember what day it is, but I'll probably have something that says like Monday, Tuesday, you know? I just don't have that in my brain right now. That being said, I finished The Vanishing Half and this was a book that as soon as I finished it, I had to put everything in my life aside and just sit and think about it because what the fuck? You know, I read The Mothers, which was Britt Bennett's like debut novel back in 2017. And I remember feeling the same way. I just had to like sit with the book and I made the mistake of reading it in one sitting. It's a short book, but like don't read it in one sitting. Um, But yeah, I ended up journaling yesterday and listening to it and I was like getting really involved. <laughs> I was getting really involved with these characters. This is very much a character-driven story. It's very much about racial constructs. It's very much about how when you can pass as white in society and you start to actually take on that identity, how it's very easy for you to uphold like racist beliefs and thoughts and ideologies. Um, apparently this is like based off of a true town that Britt Bennett's mother talked about at one point, but there's no like, even Britt Bennett says this, there's no history of it. Like you can Google it and you won't really find anything about it. And she says as much in her acknowledgements. This is just really good. And I can't even explain to you what it's about because I feel like it's important to go into this book without knowing a ton about it. You just know that there are two twin sisters that have grown up in this town where everybody is very, very much wrapped up in the idea of being as white as possible. And these two twins don't really want to live in this town anymore. They decide to leave the town and upon leaving, they end up going their separate ways. And one of them goes into society passing as a white woman and the other one kind of takes the opposite path. So it's really interesting to see how that has affected their lives. The story is definitely much different than I thought it would be. This is very much a character study and a social study. You're studying um, just like social constructs and the hierarchies in society. Yet you're also following like two generations in a family and how their lives have turned out because of various reasons and various decisions that other people have made. And you're introduced into a lot of really interesting and complex side characters that play a big role in each of the like very main character. There's a lot of characters, but there's like four really main characters and there's like two side characters that are important. And then there's like various surrounding characters that play a part and everybody's important they play a role in a different way there's no like throwaway characters you know what i mean every character is important and plays a role in each person's lives for different reasons and i just think that that's really cool because it mimics how life is there are people who come into your life and play a role and then they leave and you may never see them again or they come back later on in life so i just i don't know this was a great this was great it's like a, it's a family saga, so it's very character driven. There's a plot, but it's not as important as the characters and the characters' decisions. I'm a big character driven type of person, so to me, this was incredible and that's how I felt about the mothers. For me, Britt Bennett has an amazing way of constructing characters and how those characters interact and just like 
capturing family dynamics in a way that's really realistic to me and I can relate in specific ways but at the same time I learn a lot from her books and I feel so deeply about the characters and the trajectory in which their stories are going so um all I can say is I get the hype I get the hype. I predicted that this would be a 5 out of 5 for me and in reality this is about a 4 or 4.5 and the reason for that really is the intricacies of all of the characters and the fact that it is spanning 20 plus years and so it can get confusing. Um, it's going between past and present and so at times I was a little bit confused about where we were at in the book and like the significance of a character and kind of piecing everything together. There's just, there are a lot of moving parts, I think is what threw me off at times. It didn't completely take me out of the story. I was still very much invested in the characters. I feel like I'm really, really in the mood now for like these family sagas and literary fiction. Even though literary fiction is like really hit or miss for me, I'm now in the mood for that. And I'm not feeling that great, so I wanna buy a book. So maybe I'll go buy a book. Talk me out of it in the comments. So now that I finished The Vanishing Half, I think I'm going to move on and start... I think I'm going to start Take a Hand Danny Brown. I was thinking of starting Ghost Squad, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to start Take a Hand Danny Brown just because I need something a little more lighthearted. And if Get a Life, Chloe Brown is any indication, I will laugh out loud at this book because I definitely laughed a lot in Get a Life, Chloe Brown. Like, Talia Hibber is amazing at writing banter. Makes me laugh every time. <laughs> Take hit Danny Brown and as I predicted this is a four stars for me it was just as cute and witty and there was great banter like get a like Chloe Brown. Talia Hibbert can do no wrong when it comes to banter and before I get into like my overall thoughts about this in terms of if I liked get a life Chloe Brown more than take a hint Danny Brown I don't know. I can't say I liked one more than the other because they're really different. And I'm not meaning structurally because I do think that this followed a very similar, if not exact, structure as Chloe Brown's did. I more so mean that like the characters are really different. They're going through different things. They're experiencing different things. And the situations that they're in are really different. So I don't want to compare them fully. The only thing I will say that this book truly has over Chloe Brown is that the third act, which is where the conflict comes in, was much better done in here. It was like a conflict that you could see coming, especially since you go into it knowing that there's like a happy ending element. So you kind of can see where the conflict is going, but it also makes sense to who the two characters are and where both of their head spaces are at and like the situation they've put themselves in. So I felt like their whole conflict made sense and it didn't feel out of place or jarring. Whereas in Get a Life Chloe Brown, I felt like the third act conflict didn't didn't really make any sense um, and it's not that it didn't make any sense it just came out of nowhere and um, it felt really jarring I felt like I had whiplash basically and it pulled me out of the story as for take a hand Danny Brown um, I loved Danny and I love Zaf I think they're really great characters I think Talia Hibbert does an amazing job with main characters and especially main characters that are going through difficult life moments so Zaf is dealing with anxiety and grief and loss of family members and this is something that is addressed a lot in this book and Zaf has a nonprofit that actually tries to destigmatize mental health especially for young men I really loved Zaf's character Character and I resonated deeply with many of the things that he was going through and thinking about. I really enjoyed the moments when he was talking about loss and like when you have to address that with somebody else, especially somebody that may be a significant other. I just really, really appreciated those moments in his head. They felt really real. They felt like things that I have thought about or would think about at different points in time in regards to loss. And then I just really loved Danny because Danny is bisexual and she's kind of in a position where she doesn't want to be in a relationship. She just wants to sleep around and just like chill, you know, because she is trying to work on her career. She's trying to finish her PhD and be a professor. And she kind of sees herself in a way where she's not a relationship material. 
I haven't read many characters where they're so comfortable in their sexuality that they are freely admitting that like they just want to have sex and I really loved that about Danny despite where the story obviously is going I just loved that about Danny because she was so in tune with herself and what she wanted at points in time and of course I really liked Zaf and Danny's banter while I was rooting for them as a couple in many ways I also liked their friendship enough to be okay with them being friends in the end although that's not like who Zaf's character is is he's just the soft boy and I love that so yeah this was a four out of four stars for me it was very cute I think that for me Talia Hibber is like a go-to romance writer I have yet to find romance that I'm like absolutely head over heels for but this is the closest thing for me it does make me really excited to read Eve's book as for the rest of the night I'm thinking about just watching YouTube or some episodes of the hills but I'm also thinking about picking up the band book club. So yeah, I might pick this up tonight until I fall asleep, but for sure I'll pick it up tomorrow morning and then I will probably pick up Ghost Squad on audiobook. I saw that it was on Scribd, so I think I'm going to start listening to that sometime tomorrow, like in the afternoon or whatever. <laughs> I finished the band book club this morning and I really really enjoyed this one I think it's one of those books that I would put in the hands of a lot of people um, especially because it had a really important message and something that I think is very applicable to today I usually have a hard time reading memoirs and this is no different I have a hard time reading them I don't really enjoy reading memoirs but if I had to give this a star rating it's a four stars. I think I predicted that it would be a five star read for me in the beginning of this. And it's simply four stars because of the ending, which I'll talk about in a minute. But this book, so this takes place in 1983 in South Korea during South Korea's Fifth Republic. And basically there's a military force that's enacting power through censorship, torture, and they're murdering protesters it's a lot i mean it's not extremely graphic in terms of what you see but you know what's happening and so it's a little bit jarring but it's obviously more jarring because these are factual things the main character hyun suk is the author of this book so you're following her character as she goes into college as a freshman and she is sort of learning about people protesting and doing things behind closed doors there's literally a banned book club where they read books that talk about political activism 
about rising up against governments, but all of these books are books that have been censored or banned within South Korea. So they're kind of doing everything behind closed doors. They're printing like black market newspapers so that people can be aware of what is really happening that's not being reported in the news. Um, and you follow a few characters who do get captured and they're getting tortured for information. So there were a few moments in here that I absolutely loved. Um, I actually marked them and I want to read a few of the lines in here to give you an idea of like what is being discussed. One of the first lines that stood out to me was um, a conversation that was happening between two characters and they're talking about their leader and how he's come to power and like why people are not rising up against him. He doesn't care if we believe him or not. He created such a divide between the people who believe his lies and those who don't that the country is too torn apart to come together and properly oppose him. And then Hyun Suk responds with, our parents have been hiding this from us. And he responds, worse, they just got so beaten down by all of it for so long that they got tired of talking about it and it became normal. There's also a section in here, which I'm gonna show you guys. It's this section. And it actually has all of the black squares that have writing in them are actually books that they're reading. And I marked that page because I wanted to look up some of these books. And then there was this interesting moment where there's a character who is kind of like, I don't understand why you guys keep protesting and disrupting our learning because they're having lots of protests and the protests are like, they're disruptive, but um, they're obviously for a greater cause. But there are some students who they are sick of them because they think it's rich people protesting and disrupting the students who don't have money and this is like their only way to get a good job. And so one of these characters is kind of like finally at their breaking point and they yell at Hyun Suk and Hyun Suk notices that she's reading a particular book called White Fang by Jack London and asks her if she's ever read Iron Heel, which is also by Jack London and the character responds that she's never heard of it. And she basically says like only one of those books is banned. It's funny how if you were reading his dystopian sci-fi novel with a minor subplot about fascists ruling Korea, you'd be taken to jail. So you gotta wonder, do they ban books because they see danger in their authors or because they see themselves in their villains? So there's lots of good lines in here, but I guess with the ending, while I enjoyed the ending, I, it was one of those situations where it takes place almost 20 years later. And the whole point of it is that like, they're kind of in a similar situation as they were in 1983. And one of the characters basically makes the comment that like, obviously, freedom and progress is not linear and oftentimes things are cyclical and we continue fighting for similar things but as long as we continue to fight things do change and in this situation in 2016 everybody was rising up things weren't behind closed doors so he's just making the point that like while we are in a similar situation in this particular situation in the future the things that we fought for in 1983 behind closed doors are now out in the open. So you're seeing these changes, which I liked about the ending, but the other part about the ending was that there's like this big info dump about what every character was doing and you're like catching up on 20 years of what has happened with all of them. And it just felt kind of cheesy, um, but I did like knowing what happened with some of these characters. It just felt oddly rushed and like a lot of info being thrown at you. But otherwise, I highly recommend this. And this is one of the Shaded Choice Award winners that I had not heard anything about. And I think I've said a few times that this was one of the books that was difficult to get. I can totally see why it was one of the Shaded Choice Award winners. And I do think that this is definitely worth the read. So now I just have Ghost Squad and and Legendborn. And I think I'm going to spend the rest of the day listening to Ghost Squad while I do different things. I didn't fix my bookshelf yesterday, so I might do that. Or I might just like, you know, fuck off and play video games. I don't really know. It's Sunday. 
as you can see, it's another day where I don't know what the fuck to do with my hair. I'm a girl sitting in front of a Brad Mono video wanting to cut some bangs, even though he's desperately telling people to stop cutting bangs. Yet here I am, bored with my hair, kind of feeling like maybe I'm gonna do something impulsive that I'll regret. I don't know. As for reading, I actually did end up spending the rest of the day listening to Ghost Squad yesterday after I finished the band book club. I still didn't organize my bookshelves, which I might do today, but don't hold me to that because obviously we're gonna play Animal Crossing while I finish the rest of this audiobook. So how am I feeling about Ghost Squad? That's the point of this, but I'm talking about a million other things. I think I said this in my childhood favorites video. I've never been a big middle grade reader, um, mainly because I tried to read a few middle grades in the past and it just didn't work for me. So I thought maybe like middle grades just not for me. Um, but then when I reread all of the books in my childhood favorites, I had a lot of fun and it made me feel like the problem was I was reading the wrong things. And I think that's true. I, I think it's partially true on both sides. I don't think that middle grade is going to be like my go-to genre from here on out, but I do think that when I want something a little bit lighter and fast paced and most likely doesn't have a romantic element to it, I'll probably go to middle grade because I'm really liking Ghost Squad. I love the main character Lucelli and her best friend Sid and I like the concept of the story. I think I said that I'm a big Casper fan and a big like ghost fan, but the story got even better when Sid's grandmother Babette starts being more involved in the plot. I love Babette. I want to grow up and be Babette. But yeah, I'm going to continue listening. I think I have about an hour and a half left in the audiobook and then I will update you guys on my final thoughts. But for now, we're going to try to fix my island. Here she goes. Here she goes again. Oh, oh. You got where you needed to go? Did you get where you needed to go? Hi, Olive and I are here to tell you that we really loved Ghost Squad and it was a five out of five, even though we predicted a four out of five. And we're both really excited because I want to read more from this author and one of the reasons I wanted to do this video, one of the reasons we wanted to do this video, right, Olive, was because I wanted to discover new authors and like new books. Oh God, <laughs> ma'am, you have no respect for the filming process. Okay, what I was trying to say was that I really loved Ghost Squad. It was a five out of five for me, so I was wrong about my prediction of a four out of five. And honestly, I think it can hold up to some of the YA that I've read because it touched on a lot of really great topics and I loved the characters. I think the number one thing that made me love this story so much was the fact that Lucelli and Sid had such an amazing friendship that touched on the ideas of like found family and what found family means especially at a young age and especially in they're in the U.S. and the U.S. has like this weird thing where it's like blood is thicker than water. I'm sure it's everywhere but I my experience is from the U.S. especially because if you've lost family members whether or not they've passed away or certain circumstances lead you to not wanting that family member in your life or vice versa like found family is really important and I really appreciated the way that it was discussed and the way that the topic came up organically. I also have complained in my childhood favorites vlog about the trope where parents don't believe children and how it grates on me because children are not dumb and their opinions are not invalid and so that was something that really grated on me when I was reading those middle grades but in this one Lucelli's dad and Sid's grandmother are very much the opposite of that trope. They believe Lucelli and Sid were when they say they got themselves into a situation and they try to help them out of that situation. Sid's grandma especially was one of my favorite characters in the story. She is so funny. But yeah, I just really love this. It made me want to read more middle grade. It definitely makes me want to seek out things that are similar to this. <laughs> I've been listening to Legendborn and I had to stop and grab my highlighter because I'm only like maybe a chapter in. I possibly am two chapters in and I was already like crying. 
I didn't know the main character lost her mom. I have lost my mom and some of the stuff she's talking about in terms of grief and like trying to understand other family members' griefs, griefs, grief after losing somebody was like so on point because I feel like I've said the exact same thing to other people. I don't know. I feel like this book is going to fuck me up. Hi, I finished. I finished Legendborn and we. I finished reading. Hello, my cat just scared the shit out of me. <laughs> okay, what I was saying was that I have finished this vlog. Technically, I've read every Shaded Choice Award winner now. Um, so let's talk about Legendborn. And then we'll talk about the Shaded Choice Awards and like the winners and reading them and that experience. So as I said in a previous clip, I'm not always a big fan of King Arthur retellings. I can't say I'm completely against them or that I hate them and that every time I read a book about a King Arthur retelling, I end up hating it because I actually really did like this book. So for my star rating, I gave this a four stars. I think my prediction for it was a five stars. And this is mainly a four stars because of the things that I said in the previous clip. I've read a few retellings about um, like Camelot and the Round Table and about King Arthur and um, like Merlin and it just doesn't intrigue me as much as other like royalty type stories but honestly I completely understand why people are saying this is a book that you absolutely should read and especially if you love King Arthur retellings, the Round Table, all of that and you enjoy like dark academia themes this is absolutely for you plus it touches on a lot of really important topics. The four stars comes from the fact that I loved our main character Brie. I loved that she was constantly questioning the system that she was placed into and I loved that we got to explore a bit of her ancestry and a different type of magic. I enjoyed learning about her ancestry and her history. One of the aspects that really hit me hard was the fact that our main character has just lost her mom and she's really going through that grief and she's talking about it and there are a few lines in this story that I actually was tearing up at because I related so deeply to them. Um, I'm gonna read you one of them because it hit me really hard <laughs> and it's actually in the first couple of pages of the book. So it's page 16 and she's talking about like trying to understand somebody else's grief even if you're grieving for the same person and how different it is. Our grief is for the same person but our grief is not the same. It's like those bar magnets in physics class. You can push the matching poles together but they don't want to touch. I can't touch my dad's grief. Don't really want to. So it was lines like that that really just hit me hard. Um, there's more like that throughout the book and there's more discussion of having PTSD and trauma related to grief but also intergenerational trauma and even in the author's notes Tracy Dion actually talks and touches on grief and loss and how it's not commonly discussed the amount of grief and trauma and PTSD and different related um, things that can come from losing a parent, especially if you've lost a parent young. I was 19 when I lost my mom and younger when my dad was gone. So it was really refreshing to have a story that is talking about grief and trauma but there's the added layer of intergenerational trauma that she's discussing and I just really, really love to see that in a fantasy, especially a YA fantasy. And I really thought the aspects of power and who has power and how it's transferred and questioning how that power transfers and what that means for society and what that has meant for generations. That was incredibly done. Um, there's a few magic systems happening here and I thought one specific magic system was so incredible. So those were the aspects that I really liked. I agree that I think this is a book everybody should read, especially if you love YA fantasy and especially if you love King Arthur retellings, like this is probably going to be the perfect book for you. I really, really enjoyed it. Just like I said, no shade to King Arthur. I couldn't care less about you and the lineages and all of that. All in all, I think this is a great experience for me, mainly because it taught me that I can enjoy middle grade and that I should 
try to pick up more middle grades, especially something that falls into the vein similar to Ghost Squad. I learned about the band Book Club. I got to read a memoir that I wasn't even aware of, first off, and secondly, a memoir that was discussing censorship and torture and fascism and protesting, and that progress isn't always a linear line. Sometimes it's cyclical, but there are small changes that you can see. I got to read Take a Hand Danny Brown, which I wasn't even planning on reading because I'm not a big romance reader, but this made me realize that there are some romances out there that I should give a shot, especially when I'm feeling really anxious or down, and now I understand why everybody is reading romance these days because it's a nice escape. And while I was always planning on reading The Vanishing Half, I was pushed to read it sooner rather than later. And it kind of solidified my love for specific literary fiction. And I really appreciate that because sometimes I think that I don't like literary fiction. And then I pick up something like this and realize that there's always something for somebody in every genre and I need to stop being a picky bitch. So I think that you guys should go check out the Shaded Choice Award winners, get to know the creators of the Shaded Choice Award, and hopefully they do it again this coming year. I would be excited to see that. I have everything linked down below, by the way. I have the Shaded Choice Awards live show that they did, and the website, and all of the information to the three creators, Ashley Princess and Jasmine. So please go check them out, check out the Shaded Choice Awards, and let me know down below if you've read any of these, or if you read any of the Shaded Choice Award winners, and how you liked them. And I will talk to you guys next time. Bye!